Welcome to another episode of Outliers. I'm your host, Daniel Scrivener, and we have another incredible show for you today. On Outliers, I decode what the top 1% of performers have mastered and what they've learned along the way. In each episode, I dive deep to uncover the tools, habits, and ideas that we can all apply in our own lives. Today, I'm talking to Nathan Bachez, and we go deep on business strategy, including what founders get wrong, seeing trade-offs as opportunities, businesses as interdependent systems, and balancing deep work with business building. In the area of business and product strategy, Nathan is clearly an expert. He helped create and launch Product Hunt. He served as the head of product at Gimlet Media, which was acquired by Spotify in 2019 for $230 million. He then joined Substack as VP of product. And now he writes and publishes a paid newsletter that's all about business strategy called Divinations. But there's more to the story. Divinations is part of a subscription bundle that Nathan and his co-founder Dan Shipper are building called Everything. They describe everything as a bundle of the best modern business writing. And as a subscriber, I can tell you that everything is incredible. To learn more, just visit everything.substack.com. And with that, please enjoy this business strategy masterclass with Nathan Bachez. I am so excited for today's show. I've been thinking about this for the last handful of weeks. I just furiously took a bunch of notes and tried to make sure that I could get in everything that I think we can cover. Super excited to have you on the show. Welcome to Outliers, Nathan Bachez. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here too. So I wanted to start a little bit by going back and kind of covering your, you know, origin story as it were in a couple of leaps, because I think that a lot of people aren't aware of all you've done before founding everything and starting to write divinations. Um, so if we kind of rewind a little bit, can you set up, you know, what it was like to help found Product Hunt, then your journey to Hardbound, and then how that took you to, to everything? Yeah, Totally. Product Hunt was was crazy. It was uh, one of those things in life that when it's happening at the time, you're just like, oh, it's like a fun side project. And then it turns into this thing that that is totally different from just a fun side project. And Huge. I feel I feel completely lucky to have stumbled into that situation. <laughs> but I mean, the story is basically, I met Ryan Hoover, I think like most of us through the internet. <laughs> and um, so we, we became friends. This is like, you know, before he had started Product Hunt. So I guess it was a little easier just to like email him for coffee. And we met up a couple of times and we had actually also worked on, a, on another project. It's funny because it's actually similar to what I'm working on now. It's like it was writing related. It was called Question Club. But anyway, the basic idea of it is we would like ask a question and then a whole bunch of different people would write a blog post about the same question, basically answering the same question. So we did that for a little while. Then, you know, a little bit later, Ryan had this idea for Product Hunt and he set up another kind of like email list for it. And that was going really well. And I was one of the people on the email list. And so we were just like, hey, this is cool. Like, what if we turned it into a website? I could like design and code the first version of it. So I did. So we worked together. This was like Thanksgiving 2013. I was at my parents' house. I was working at General Assembly at the time. And so it was just a side project. I had like kind of asked my boss there. I was like, hey, is it cool if I do a side project? And he was like, yeah, that's <laughs> fine. As long as it's not like, you know, taking up too much you of your time or whatever. Yeah, exactly. So we launched the first version, I think, it was like five days after I started writing code because it's a pretty simple site and we wanted to make sure we really kept the scope kind of like light. It's like, okay, you can post a link. People can upvote products. People can comment on product. I don't even know if we actually had comments in the very first version, but it was like one of those things where we added it like three days after launch. And then we added <laughs> like pagination so that we don't load every product ever submitted to, into the database on every page load like four days after launch. It was one of those kind of situations. But yeah, so it just it's kept doing really well. And I was like, the main kind of designer developer working on it with Ryan for, I don't know, maybe about a month or two. And as it kept gaining steam, Ryan was like, you know, I think I want to go full time on this and make it a business. It made total sense because it was just, it was really starting to work. But my thought was I had already made plans to like move to New York for my job at General Assembly. And I thought Product Hunt was awesome, but I just didn't know if I could put in the energy to be like the best co-founder for it. And I felt like, if I did that without having the energy, that it would go really wrong. 
Yep. And it just, it seemed like a little bit too, like maybe just like risky or something. I don't know. I think a big part of it, honestly, was just our plan was in motion to go to New York. But so, so my wife now, then girlfriend and I, we moved to New York for General Assembly. Product Hunt kept blowing up and it was just like amazing to watch it and kind of like cheer it on and, and see all the other really amazing people join the team. There's a tweet recently that the Product Hunt Mafia from those days is pretty, is pretty stacked. You've got, you know, a lot of people too many to name, but there's, there people have gone on to do really, really amazing things from then. I think it gave me some confidence, like you can build things and, and they'll work sometimes. And so like, maybe not every time, but there's not anything like, there's no inherent secret brilliance or something like that to coming up with stuff. You just have to like pay attention and no- notice what you like and, and try and build more things like what you like. And some of them will probably work out better than others. The other thing that really it taught me was like just the importance of like relentlessness and like community building and just people. And Ryan did an amazing job of that. And different products grow in different ways. But that was one of those moments that taught me like, okay, this isn't the only move, but if you want to do this move, here's how you do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. With like what yeah. Ryan did. And so that was, that was just so cool. And it was really, it was just really lucky. Right. You know, it was really Ryan's like community building and, and vision for the thing that made it what it is. There's lots of, I think people who could have coded and designed the web app. And I think I did a pretty good job at that part. So it was worth something, but man, what it became is really really a function of the vision and the community building stuff that that Ryan was doing. Yeah, it really feels like the community there is ultimately the product because it's yes. such a like vibrant community. The people that, you know, I know Chris Messina, who's one of the number one, I think, product hunter or hunters on the website. And he, he it's like, you know, the perfect platform for someone like him who's always looking for something that's interesting, super excited to share it. And it's like the Internet finally had a place where if you were a founder starting something, you knew that you could at least get people who were close to as excited as you were and were willing to be kind of gracious with you. And yeah. um, if you were someone who's just excited about new stuff, it's like nothing could be better. Totally. And the vision has always been like to create a more welcoming place on the internet for people to try new things, which yeah. is just so good <laughs> and needed, you know? And it's crazy to like imagine like how many people built their first thing because they thought, well, I could launch it on Product Hunt and I'm curious how it would do there. I know that's how I felt before Product Hunt about Hacker News. Of course, it, Hacker News is notoriously much less uh, supportive. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> of an atmosphere. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's been amazing to see what it became. So you have that experience at Product Hunt. Maybe fast forward a little bit. When did you have the idea for Hardbound? How did you get that rolling? And what did you learn building that during the time that you were there? So the reason I was moving to New York and, and didn't join Product Hunt was for General Assembly, which I had already been working there for a while, but it was going well. And they were based in New York and they were like, hey, you know, you could come here. And New York is pretty cool. So my <laughs> wife and I moved from San Francisco to New York. And the thing I was working on there that was going well was this thing called Dash. And it was a way, basically General Assembly is a company that has these, well, now they're all online, but at the time they're all in person courses that are like really intensive. It's like a boot camp, right? And they needed something that was like easy and sort of like free for you to do online to kind of see, hey, is this kind of thing for me? Like, what kind of qualities does General Assembly like teach at generally? Like, does this does this give me confidence? Do I feel like I'm getting it? The idea is that it would help people kind of get comfortable with the idea of making this huge jump in their career. And there were products that existed, like, you know, Code Academy, like a bunch of other stuff like that, books. But none of it felt like what we needed. We had like a specific way of teaching new people. Okay, like what's like sort of the first lesson you would give someone if you wanted them to like, come into it and come out of it actually with like the maximum amount of energy and like what's the right order to teach things in it felt like a lot of the existing pedagogy was like if you can imagine there's um a friend of mine who actually was the co-founder of dev bootcamp who compares it to like drop parachuting into like a uh, you know desert (laughs) island or something like where you're stranded it's like okay imagine you have this giant manual that's like an index of all the possible things you may want to know where do you start do you start at just the very top on page one I don't know, maybe, but like that thing is just ordered in alphabetical order or something like that. It doesn't, that's not like the most important thing to tell someone immediately. Like immediately yeah. you would want to be like, when you land, the first thing you need to do is find a source of water. So there, and it's like, you kind of like give people this like strategy for dealing with the environment. And that's what we wanted to do with Dash was like sort of skip over the stuff that's like a lot of, like a lot of things when you learn HTML are like, okay, let's start with the head tag. And then, and the body tag or whatever. And it's like, and in the head, you've got the title. And it's like, you're going straight down the HTML line by line. It's like, just because that's the order that it 
goes in doesn't mean that's the order that it should like sort of grow in in terms of like how you develop it like what's the starting point is like yeah. let's let's make some text show up on the screen let's make like a input show up on the screen so we can like kind of from the very first lesson make it feel like okay this is interactive and in the future we'll tell you how to do something with the stuff people type in this input or whatever yeah just get some traction and build confidence totally so that's a long-winded way of saying that that i was really interested in how people learn things on the internet the thing i was most sensitive to is people getting bored and quitting and I thought if we had this big intimidating wall of text for some dense technical topics that a lot of people would just leave, right? And they'd feel like, and this thing isn't for me. And I thought if we could obfuscate a lot of that complexity and present each moment that you're learning as like a simple visual thing that contains just what you need to know right then and we pace it in a good way and like kind of really manage the sort of cognitive load that people have to face when they're doing this thing, that a lot more people would complete it. And so part of that is the way you write the content. But another big part of it is the format we were experimenting with this kind of like slideshow format. And I did some early sort of like prototypey versions of it and showed it to people. And they were like, oh, this is really cool. Like this was, this is just like other employees at General Assembly. They were like, okay, I, I still remember actually sitting on the couch with like the sort of very first prototype and showing it to one of my coworkers who wasn't, who wasn't technical. And she was like, this just makes sense. Like, why didn't anyone show it to me this way before? And so that was like the moment I was like, okay, cool. There's something to this format that basically became Dash, like a much more elaborate version of that. And I was working on it for a while and really pumped about it. And I mean, honestly, like when I left in 2015, that was like two years into Dash and probably like, I think 300,000 ish people had used it. And so now I don't know what it is, but they're still using it. It's still active. So I, I hope it's taught like, you know, maybe like a half a million or a million people, the basics of how to code, at least introduce them to it. And wow. it was just such a fun experience working on it. And it felt like I was doing kind of like a mini startup within General Assembly. It's this new product that's like modularly connected to the rest of the company. And I was itching for something like that again, because my role after that kind of shifted towards more broad, like I was a product manager in charge of like a couple different products that like where I was responsible for. And like, it was a lot less that kind of startup feel almost of like, you're in the weeds, like building a new thing. I guess it was like the Peter principle or whatever. You like rise to your level of incompetence. I don't think I was super competent um, <laughs> at that job at that time. And so the boss who recruited me in, who was one of the co-founders of the company, he left, he was like starting a new company. I was just like thinking about what I wanted to do next. The thing I kept coming back to is this like slideshow format that we had for the lessons um, in Dash. And I really wanted to like make something kind of like that, but just not limited to like learning how to code and not like a slideshow that's on your desktop computer where you're like writing code and all this kind of stuff. But like, what if you like just took the slide part and you made that really amazing and you used it as more of like a general storytelling device. And I had seen this other thing that made me really think that this could be good called Fish, <laughs> which is an app by a guy named Robin Sloan, who's an author of several really awesome books, including like Sourdough and Mr. Penumbra's 24-hour bookstore. He's a great, great author and a guy that I've gotten to meet a couple of times. And I don't know, maybe I would call him a friend. I don't know if you call me a friend, <laughs> but I admire his work for sure. And anyway, Fish was a huge inspiration because it was a whole app that was basically like a slideshow and it had this really cool sort of like tappable storytelling format. And I thought this is a lot like the format for Dash. And that was just one app, one story. He was kind of done with it. He was working on other things. There was a company in New York that was sort of incubated by Betaworks, which is like a startup incubator accelerator investor in New York. That was called Tapestry. And they did, they basically took fish and they're like, let's make a platform where anyone can create this kind of content. And some people did, and some of them were amazing, but it didn't take off because it was really hard to create in that format. And I thought, well, okay, it's hard to create in that format. It's also hard to like make movies and books and stuff <laughs> and podcasts. <laughs> but like people dedicate a lot of energy to it if they feel like it's worth it. And they don't feel like this is worth it because they haven't seen anyone do it successfully before. But like I think it can be done successfully. So what if we created like a studio that created this app and we created the stories that go in the app and it were sort of like a like a Pixar or like a book publisher or something or a media company really. At first I really conflated like how much people loving a story as like uh, virality of a story could be like a one-to-one -one relationship with just how much people loved it or like quality or something like that. But I think I pretty quickly realized when we were doing it that like our stories were the kinds of things that there were definitely some people that really loved it. Like it was impossible to ignore the like feedback we were getting from people and like to know that there are some people just deeply loved what we were making, but like it, they also weren't going viral. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was a weird thing to kind of like wrap my head around, but it kind of makes sense. Like, you know, books don't go viral. Like a lot of movies don't even really go viral. Like sometimes things become pop culture phenomenons, but that's a little bit different from like a viral BuzzFeed article, just the mechanics of like how it grows and how it spreads. It was a little bit stressful because we needed our stories to like 
grow and get a lot more traffic. And on the one hand, people were telling us we loved them. And on the other hand, you know, and a lot of them did, like they got 30, 40, 50,000 views or something. And those are pretty big. Like even for mainstream publications, there's a lot of articles that get a lot less views than that. So you need something to like have a spark for it to reach that amount of viewership. But still, it was it was just really hard, basically. And it wasn't very understood by venture capitalists. And, and also at that time, like, we were an app and the narrative was like, there's no apps, like app, apps are done kind of. <laughs> this was the beginning of like crypto kind of mania and chatbot mania. And it was just like a, definitely taught me how important narratives are to like what gets funded. So it's very hard. <laughs> it's very hard to raise money. You know, we had, we had several strikes against us, I would say. We raised over the course of like two years, about $420,000, which I, I say about, it was exactly $420,000. <laughs> and the reason why was not because of like 420. It's just like we raised an initial 200000 and then we raised another 100000 And then we got into Techstars and they invest 120000 And that was just like what they invest. So we ended up with 420000 <laughs> which is, you know, fine. I'm, it's a good number. Yeah, it's a good it. number. Yeah, that's why not. So the app was pretty simple. You open it up and there's a list of stories. And... The vision was more about the format than what kind of content we would have. So in the beginning, it was a little bit unfocused. It was just like stuff that I thought was cool. It was all really nonfiction and it tended towards like sciency or history kind of explainers or like businessy kind of explainers. So one that we did that was one of our best ones and one of my favorite ones is called What is Fire? And it was just literally like, yeah, fire. What is it? What actually is happening there? <laughs> And it's cool because there's like all sorts of stuff when you really zoom in that principles of like laws of, of nature and of the universe that you can like learn just through the lens of something really simple. Like when you're looking at a candle and you're just wondering what's going on there, like you can, mm-hmm. you can learn about it. That was still when we were thinking maybe we'd be some sort of platform and we'd have like multiple channels and like other media companies might create channels or other people might create channels and all this kind of stuff. But then what we ended up settling in on was, okay, no, there's no channels. Like, it's not going to be this broad platform. We're going to be very focused around a specific type of content. So we had to develop an editorial vision in addition to like a format vision. So we decided to really focus on nonfiction book summaries because we thought, okay, there's all this demand for like, there's lots of books that you've heard of that you're kind of interested in that you're not sure if you want to read or not. Why don't we give you something to do that teaches you something from the book? And gives you a taste for whether or not that is going to be the right book for you. And then we can align ourselves with like authors in the publishing industry. You know, the same reason why if you have a new movie coming out, you may go on a talk show. Maybe if you have a new book coming out, you like do a hardbound. It's like hmm. the the idea we were thinking. And that, that may help with some of our economics in terms of like covering costs of getting these things created. But they would still be really editorially focused and like good and like you know, it's not just like an ad for a book. We wanted it to be something that people could genuinely just like love and consume on their own, kind of like a book review. And so, and there's, there's publications like that, like the New York Review of Books, Paris Review of Books, like these are sort of serving the exact same function. And so that was sort of the vision for how the content evolved. And then the format, just to give kind of, I I sort of alluded to like, it was sort of a slideshowy thing. The way it worked is you, when you tap into a story, it opens up, it's like full screen vertical, kind of like an Instagram story, except it doesn't auto advance. So when you tap, it goes to the next thing, but then it just waits on you because it's, it's reading and we want to give you like space to read. And every screen was like visual. So there was like some sort of background, like photo or illustration. Oftentimes it felt kind of like a comic book where like there was characters in a scene, characters that have speech bubbles and stuff like that. Sometimes it would be a little bit more like abstract than that. There's other companies kind of adjacent to us that did incredibly well off a of very similar model like Pocket Gems is one that comes to mind, um, or episodes. These are more like fiction oriented at like younger readers. Those did really, really well. I think they're still doing really well as businesses too. We sort of had this little corner of it that felt kind of like, one, one way to compare it is it's like a really nice like coffee table book with like beautiful visuals, except this is one that you also are like engrossed in as a story. Oftentimes coffee table books are more for like perusing than for like getting sucked into, you know? Um, but yeah, that, that was the format. Oh, the other cool thing about it is, When you tap and it goes to the next slide, basically, it like animates into the next slide, which you can do a lot of really cool stuff with. It feels like very smooth when you're when there's a smooth animation between one thing to the next. Um, And we could do a lot of cool sort of like storytelling techniques. So it's like you can like tap and then it like zooms into the character's face and then like Mm -hmm. another speech roll pops up or something. And like that's the kind of stuff that or it could like pan to another scene or like, you know, you could juxtapose one thing to another in a way that because of the transition, it makes sense that you're like you're creating a connection between those two 
things. It was a lot of fun. I learned a ton about visual storytelling. It was like watching a lot of every frame of painting about cinematography. It's a great mm-hmm. YouTube channel about cinematography. It's great. Uh, reading, like understanding comics by Scott McCloud. These things aren't really like writing. Like they involve written words, but it's more than that. In order to make it feel really great, you've got to kind of like master these other these other parts of storytelling. So, and the team that we're working on it together, like we're all kind of like learning these things together. So I still think some format like that could be popular eventually. It's a very long and slow process to make new storytelling formats become popular because there's this huge network effect of like people are used to it. There's distribution channels for it. So there's like a market for it. So you want to create for it because that's a place you can go where there's audience and attention and money as a creator. And so it's been interesting to watch like, I mean, it's taken podcasts like a long time, (laughs) you know, to become a thing. And now it's to the point where people are willing to invest a lot of energy and money into it. And I feel like maybe a similar thing could emerge with this other sort of like visual tappable form of storytelling. It definitely feels inevitable. You know, even thinking about podcasts, it's like at its root, it's pretty esoteric, you know, and you have people that are experimenting with the format of the podcast and, you know, how do you stitch together multiple interviews into one episode? You know, there are podcasts like Reed Hoffman's Masters Masters of Scale, Scale, you know, that it does like a lot with sound effects. So it feels, no, it totally feels like something like that has to happen in the future. And, you know, even just thinking like, I think nonfiction books in my mind, I I thought that idea was, was really remarkable because nonfiction books have a ton to teach people generally. I mean, I'm pretty biased in that I think if you were to cobble together a list of the 50 best nonfiction books, I think that would be a better education than most people get in in four years of university. But it's something that, you know, it takes a lot and it's not appealing just to to sit down and read generally, you know, and so it feels like, yeah, experimenting with a format that that has to evolve eventually. The thing you said about the nonfiction books being better than education, I connect in my mind to like the the pedagogy almost of Dash, where it's like the the traditional university education you get is like that big book with the index of all the things you need to know. And you just kind of like start at the top and like you're just sort of throwing people into it. It feels kind of like boring because you're not sure how do I connect this to like what I actually need in order to survive. Yeah. Whereas nonfiction books, which evolved because of, you know, market pressures to like be interesting are kind of like a great starting point. And then I just, I wonder what the world would look like if it started at the most interesting stuff and got people engaged and like on a path and then rocketed them past Mm -hmm. what's just sort of like easy, popular stuff to read into the sort of like deeper, nerdier territory. So it's like, imagine if we gave every seventh grader like the short history of nearly everything by Bill Bryson. Amazing book, covers all sorts of different branches of science. And then you're like, okay, cool. What was most interesting to you? What questions do you have? Oh, like the stuff about light? Cool. Let's go do like all these experiments and then you can read the textbook about it. And then, oh no, actually you want to learn about biology? Okay, cool. Like we're going to go on this field trip or whatever, or like we'll dissect a frog. And at that point you're already, you care about it. So it's like, there's motivation to continue. But when you're just like, okay, let's crack open the dictionary and start at the first word. It's like, that's not how you learn language, but that's sort of like what pedagogy is based on in schools. And it's just, it's really sad to me that there seems to be no, because the main purpose it really serves in a lot of cases is like babysitting for a really long time, that that's like good enough basically for for parents and for society. But like, I don't know, it's like, doesn't feel like it's good enough anymore. Anyway, there's my rant about schooling. Yeah, everybody has learning different, you know, different learning styles. We're all wired differently. And so it definitely seems incredibly backwards that everyone learns the same way, the same content, regardless of whether they're interested or not. My understanding is you started writing divinations and that has evolved into everything. What was the process to getting to everything what you're building now? And can you just quickly set up what that is for people? So like, I guess I could really quickly connect the dots of like, Hardbound didn't work out. We basically we ran out of money. It cost a lot of money to create those stories. And we were generating some subscription revenue, but not enough. And investors just didn't want to invest. So we ran out of cash. So after that, I joined Gimlet Media. And I was there for a little while as their head of product. The plan was to make other stuff. And we did. We made a really cool Alexa skill called Chompers. That's like a toothbrush timer, basically for kids. But it's like full. It's like two minutes instead of like a timer. It's like Gimlet quality storytelling and content and songs and all this kind of wow, stuff. That's cool. And it was like, it's, it's like a really awesome product that continues to do really well. And won a can line, which was cool. Um, so I guess technically I'm a Can Lion award winner, or at least an associate of people who Amazing. won Can Lions. Add that to the I don't list. know exactly what I deserve for like product <laughs> managing the like tech side of it, but like whatever, it was fun. It was really cool to work on. And then basically Gimlet was like, we started doing a lot of this tech stuff, but like now that we're down the road a little bit, we can kind of see how much it costs and like what kind of scale we need to get to in order to pay off all these investments. How confident are we that like that's really the path for us? And so they decided to refocus on the core of like creating amazing podcasts, getting a lot of people to listen to them, to them and having the best ads like in, in podcasting mm-hmm. in, embedded in those podcasts. 
And I think that was the right decision for them, honestly. Like that was kind of the conclusion I was coming to too. And, you know, eventually, as we all know now, they got acquired by Spotify. And so we, we sort of had this like uh, amicable parting of ways. And then I had a similar thing happen basically next when, so after Gimlet, I joined Substack, which at the time nobody had heard of. It was pretty small. And they had just finished Y Combinator. I think they originally set out to hire like an engineer and then they just got excited by me because I'm like an engineer, but also like, product and design and all that. I was just extremely excited about their vision and still am learning to operate as like a member of a small team where there's no side projects. You're just like sort of going with the group on things. And there's a lot of my own like ego. I think that got in my way there of just learning how to be a supportive team member and like learning how to like listen better Mm -hmm. and not have all the ideas come from me. It's one of those things where I'm really glad that I had some opportunities right now in my career to kind of like force me to sort of realize like where I could be a better communicator and a better listener. And so I was there for like about a year. And then I was kind of just figuring out, I was in the wilderness, kind of like figuring out what I wanted to do next. You know, I thought like, should I should I start a newsletter? Like that was actually my first thought was like, I could start some sort of like solo thing, like whether on Substack or not, like maybe that would be just easier. My experience with VCs has been, you know, mixed. <laughs> or, um, you know, joining another company or something like that. It just felt like maybe that would be like the easiest and best thing for me would be like do something on my own. And then I just kind of kept getting the edge of like, I want to build a company. Yeah. And so did the kind of like San Francisco co-founder dating circuit thing, (laughs) which is like its own very specific universe. And there's a lot of really amazing people that I met and like worked on some cool projects with with people that I will remain friends with for life through that process. That's actually the best thing about co-founder dating is like in romantic dating, when you break up, maybe you're friends, but like usually not in co-founder dating. It's like, you become really great friends. And then like vast majority of the time when you break up, it's not because you don't like each other. It's just because like, it's incredibly rare to like have the right timing, have the same passion for the exact same idea. Like there's all these factors that go into it. And so I've got a couple new really great friends <laughs> out of the deal. But then eventually basically Dan called me and Dan's been a guy that I've known for a really long time and wanted to work with for seven years or something like that. Like for, for quite a long time, he was thinking about doing something in kind of like paid newsletters. I'm like, well, Duh, that's the thing that I'm into. <laughs> and so we started, yeah, we started working together then and, and haven't looked back. But that was a fun, it's, it was like a walk in the wilderness uh, year for me between hardbound not working out and being at Gimlet and having that kind of like the strategy of the company change. And that was kind of tough. You know, nothing I really could have done about that. I think it was the right decision. And then at Substack, a little bit more of my own like stuff, I think, got in the way to some extent. And also just the skill set of the role kind of not being right. And then now it finally feels like, okay, I've like, got this thing that like basically works and like I plug in and I'm happy with the way that I plug in and it and it feels like it could go on for a long time. It sounds like it was really an amazing growth curve for you and I'm sure at tons of points in time along that journey and I'm sure you probably yell in your own head about like what am I doing what is this leading towards am I ever going to be able to found this company but obviously it makes a ton of sense in hindsight. I wanted to ask one question just specifically around divinations because I think anyone who is interested in business or is interested in either founding or running a business or even being part of an executive team knows that strategy is something that they need to maybe at worst be a aware of and at best have a really good grasp for like, what is it? How do I use it and employ it at this company? But it's also one of those things that is like just really amorphous. And I feel like if you were to ask 10 people what strategy is, like they would not even be at all close in terms of what it is. When did you become interested in it? And what made you say yes to wanting to write about it day in and day out? The origin of it really came from when I was working on Hardbound. And I think my implicit assumption going into Hardbound was if you make a product experience that's like amazing enough, then the business and everything else will work. And I think for certain kinds of products, that's like basically almost true. Like if you're building a SaaS product, that's like it's a piece of software that's like basically infinitely scalable and you've got this really great product market fit and like it's growing organically and like people love it, then like you're fine. But like for other kinds of businesses that have like more real costs, you have to like figure out how do we manage these costs? Like where are we investing or not investing? Like there's more like difficult decisions that come along and like media is one of those businesses that has a lot of real costs. And there's also stuff like just managing your, for where you are and like, what's the best next step to take Mm -hmm. being in sort of like survival mode? Like, do we make one story that we invest a hundred thousand dollars in or do we make 10 stories that we invest $10,000 in? There's a lot of like, you know, real constraints and choices you have to make. And those crop up to some extent in just like regular like SaaS software, but like to a much greater extent, again, like kind of when you have real costs other Mm -hmm. than just like you're developing an app basically that people are using the software. So 
I basically just was searching for the thing that would be like a discipline, basically, that that would help have answers to some of these questions. Hmm. And I was doing it in Hardbound a little bit before Hardbound and a lot after Hardbound. <laughs> it didn't work out ultimately. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, it's possible to get way too far in the weeds. and start. It's not as if like the point is to read strategy nonstop and then you'll be prepared to like start a company and you'll have no chance of yeah. failing or whatever. But I do think that there's a lot of really helpful stuff to have in mind. Just basic principles and mental models that help you navigate the decisions you're making. Mm-hmm. I think that there's an underappreciation of it in the startup world. There's, an, there's a huge appreciation for sort of like listening to wisdom from people who have successfully started something before. There's a lot less appreciation for sort of like almost like academia, like business school strategy theory kind of stuff. Like people mm-hmm. don't nerd out about it as much. I mean, they're starting to, I think a little bit more now. I don't know how much of it is like just in the air or like because of dip, like strategy is like, you know, a good source of a lot of that kind of stuff. But that wasn't really a thing. Like no one, no one really talks about like Michael Porter's ideas or whatever, like on a day to day basis. And like Clay Christensen, definitely to a much greater extent, people talk about disruption, but like half the time, it's just like it's a bastardized version of disruption that just when they say disruption, they just mean like a successful startup that displaced an incumbent, which is like <laughs> disruption has more to it than that. So, anyway, I think that it's really helpful to kind of like define it, right? Because like it's the discipline that could like solve all my problems as a startup founder. Like, no, okay, let's like <laughs> narrow it down. The way I define strategy is, and this is based on like Michael Porter, Clay Christensen, like as best I understand the way that they define strategy, the generic version of strategy. Like if you just look it up in the dictionary, it's like a plan of action in order to achieve a goal. It's like kind of roughly what it means. And so, okay, what's the goal of a business? If we're talking about business strategy, then what's the goal of a business? It's to like make money for a really long time. It's to stick around. It's to grow, to be really large. It's to be profitable, to be defensible. So that like, it's sort of this safe kind of cash flowing thing. And so, okay, how do you do that? Well, that's a really big question. That's what the field of business strategy is really focused on. It's starting from this assumption that you want to build a business that's defensible and profitable. And somewhat in a third place, I would say really, really large. Tech really focuses on like largeness rather than profitability or or defensibility. But those are kind of the three things. It's sort of like, you know, is it vulnerable to competitors? Like, do you make a lot more than you spend? And like, you know, how, how much do you make overall? <laughs> Basically, those are, those are the kind of implied goals of business strategy. And then so then from there, you derive all these sort of like principles or frameworks or different things to kind of analyze, well, what kinds of businesses tend to be really big, be really profitable and stick around for a long time and resistant to competition? So you shared your working definition of strategy for a business. Do you have one similar for kind of individuals? And I guess, do you have a sense for what that looks like? Like, what is the goal? How does that kind of break down? And how does that inform how we all might think about those same trade-offs we have to face in our own personal life? You know, because we face yeah. that all the time, whether it's buying a home, moving to this city or that city, you know, getting married. It seems like life is full of trade-offs. But how do you think about it at the individual kind of more personal level? That's really fascinating. Honestly, I don't very often. So this is sort of like just on the fly. (laughs) But I think there's a a few really important things, which is like one, just like know your goal. On the other hand, (laughs) I don't know. It's kind of like, I think it's good to have like general broad goals and like to, but just to follow the thing you have energy for and not to like overthink it or over question it or to try and set a goal that you don't really have. Like it ends up not working usually, you know, and the goal you really have maybe so like just like implicit and like behind the scenes in your consciousness that like it's, it's animating a lot of your behavior, even if you haven't really articulated or you don't think about it a lot. Yeah. You know, in terms of like someone's career, the company of you, right. The business of you, like what is, what, what value proposition do you bring? And like, what are your, what are your marketing channels and like how, what's your defensibility and all that stuff. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff on that. My favorite is probably Cal Newport's uh, so good. They can't ignore you. And his framework is just focused on doing something that's like hard and valuable and, and rare and the passion will probably come and do something roughly in the domain of things you're like interested in. But passion is more of a symptom than a cause of success. And that the best spot to be in is when you're in the intersection of things that are like individually hard. And there's very few people in the world who kind of have both domains mastered and you can sit at that intersection and really leverage it to be like super performer or whatever. So like, you know, maybe it's the intersection of some like domain expertise, like for some specific vertical, like I know I'm a great computer programmer or like I'm an AI expert and I know everything about real estate. Like, what can you do with that? You know, like that's Mm -hmm. whether you're starting a company or going to work at a company, those are the kind of employees that like tend to create a lot of value and are able to capture a lot of, a lot of the value too. 
it seems like at the personal level, you know, just to maybe articulate what you just said in a slightly different way, it sounds very similar to Scott Adams' concept of a skill stack, you know, and as mm, individuals, yeah. it's knowing what your skill stack is, which could be as simple as knowing the things that fascinate you and leaning into those. You know, it definitely resonates with me or just the idea that passion is a is a symptom and not a cause. And I feel like I've always been rewarded in life just by embracing the stuff I'm fascinated in without worrying at all about how that will apply in the future. Because at least, you know, the course of my life so far, it feels like anything I've learned has ultimately helped inform everything else that I, <laughs> that totally. I do in, in some unexpected way in the future. But maybe it's just that, yeah, that concept of a skill stack and maybe to help frame it at both the kind of business and personal level. How do you think about how strategy fits in to the broader dimensionality of like a strategy mostly about planning and goal setting and then, you know, execution? is more about tactics like and that's kind of a very crude way to frame it but how sure. do you think about where strategy s sits where it's most helpful and where it's most useful the thing i'm most interested in is for businesses what are the dynamics of competition and how do things tend to work out so like how can we match patterns in our head of like if we do x then y will probably happen mm -hmm. it's almost like business strategy is less about like a planning process and it's more about what you're talking about during the planning process. You know, it's mm -hmm. like um, planning process is like a management technique more than a strategy technique almost. Sure. And then the actual strategy comes out of like, okay, cool. Like there's this thing called a network effect. Like, does that apply here? There's this thing called bundling. Does that apply here? Like what are the economic realities that like could cause us to succeed or fail in our goal? Yeah, it's almost thinking about it in terms of like feedback loops or reciprocal loops and understanding yours as it applies to your business, which is something I've been fascinated on. I mean, you know, it feels like every business that's been successful has been able to clearly articulate what that feedback loop is. Like, you know, we acquire customers because of X. That then helps us acquire more customers because of Y, which helps us achieve this profitability and scale, you know, because right. of Z. And if you can figure that out for your business, I think that's a great exercise in, in really understanding and chewing on the uncomfortable questions of like, what are we doing and what aren't we doing? You totally. know, why are we doing that? And, and why do we, why should we have the confidence and approach this as if this is the right approach? And what are we hoping to get out the other, you know, the other side of that? I think a good analogy for this, because I'm realizing it's, it's kind of fuzzy in my own head and I need to, I need to figure out a better way of articulating it would be like, let's say like in, in, in football or something like that, right? Like there's like, an overall planning process of like, oh, like the coaches have a meeting and then like the coach calls the play and like the quarterback kind of like executes the play and like that's sort of like a management thing. But then the reality is of like, what is the defense? Like, what are their strengths and weaknesses? Like how fast yeah. are their players? What alignment are they are they set up in? What is like their expectation of us? Probably based on history, we can assume maybe they've watched some of our film. All of those dimensions are like what people are thinking about in the moment when they're mm -hmm. deciding on what play to call or how to execute a play or how to plan. And like, it's all that. That's like the content of strategy rather than the process of strategy that's the stuff that i'm interested in it's just that instead of like you know for football you're like oh their safeties are really fast so like we need to be careful when we throw out there it's like this business is hard to compete with because they have like a network effect and so we need to understand that but it's more about like the causality of success and failure for businesses than it is about like strategy per se and the strategy is just like it's almost like a red herring where it's like what i'm really interested in is less so strategy and more so business it's just like business yeah. strategy is like the art of like making decisions, I guess, in, in business. And like, if you make them well, then, then, then the business succeeds. And of course it's more complicated than that because you have to execute them well and all this. And, and, yes. and people management is a huge thing and there's a huge creative component and all this stuff. But like at some level there is like the company chooses what to do. Right. And if you choose well, then you'll do well. Yeah. And it seems like an exercise, honestly, at the end of the day of kind of getting to know yourself. So what are you building? Why is that the right thing to build? What are the things that you have to be especially good in? You know, why should you have confidence that those are the, the right things to be spending energy and effort on? And then it really is being able to then look out and I guess have a have that same sense of what each competitor is doing and how you can compete with them. And then it's kind of the intersection of those two things. So maybe going just a little bit deeper, you talked about kind of some of the principles, some of the mental models that you lean on when it comes to thinking about strategy. Like if you wanted to help somebody understand quickly the kind of 80-20, the handful of big ideas that if you were to understand them well, if you were to be able to kind of have a firm grasp on them, everything else would just kind of be great to add on top, but it might not be necessary. Like what is that 80-20 kind of set of big important ideas that you lean on or think about often? I just want to caveat this with like, I don't think I've nailed this, but <laughs> I think probably 
the best place to start is just by understanding a business as a system of like inputs and outputs and, and feedback loops. It's really important to look at every piece of the system rather than just like, you know, the product or like there, there's basically everything is interdependent. The way that you decide who to hire and how to train those people and how to divide up responsibilities and what cadence of meetings to have, that all is like related to and connected to the brand of your product and like how much you invest in sort of like like a visual identity or like a marketing page and like where you choose to promote that stuff and like what features you choose to build into your, like let's say it's a software company, like these are all interconnected. And I think that in software, because so much of the strategy is just embodied in the software, it's very software centric. And we almost think that like nothing else matters. And I think it's really helpful to think about ways of leveraging sort of like the whole Buffalo in order to compete. And just to think of a business as a holistic system Mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, what are we? Like, what's the DNA of our company? It's the activities we choose to perform. So like, okay, what activities do we choose to perform? Well, in a software Hmm. business, most of the activities are being performed by your software for your customers. That's why they're so powerful is because they scale really nicely. In a lot of other businesses, there's, there's other types of activities that are more important. Like, you know, if you're a retail operation, the way that you hire, the way that your employees, you know, like help people decide what to buy or whatever. This is all, maybe if you have a low cost strategy, then you've, you've got to hire people who are willing to take a lower wage and they, they won't be able to have as much training and maybe you should expect higher turnover, but you should also, they care about other sets of things like access to like educational opportunities or whatever versus if you're like a really fancy like fashion boutique or whatever like there's you're going to make totally different decisions on like almost every one of those forks in the road so the first thing is thinking about is a system and then the second thing i'll borrow from kevin kwok which is like it's a it's a recursive system so there should be some core loop another way to put it is a flywheel is an idea from jim collins these are basically the same thing like loops and flywheels it's just basically like okay how does your system feed back into itself because only if you can have some sort of positive feedback loop where the thing accelerates over time will you achieve the sort of like velocity you need to be like a really large business and maybe that goal doesn't apply to you if you don't want to be a really large business like if you're a freelancer maybe you don't want to be really large but there's other ways in which you have positive feedback loops too so like Two examples. Let's start with the freelancer example because it's kind of interesting. Maybe your positive feedback loop is like you get a client, you do work, the client's really happy, and so they introduce you to other clients. All those other clients, you don't want to take them on, but maybe like you're going to skim the like top 15% of those clients and only take those on. And so you're rapidly getting like more prestigious work that gives you an opportunity to do more interesting stuff, meet more interesting mm-hmm. people, and get paid even more for each of your jobs you're taking on. So your business is growing in a certain sense, and there's a loop, there's that positive feedback loop that kind of like connects to itself, but it's not necessarily that you want to create some sort of like giant corporation or whatever. Yeah, like distill down what's happening there. It's like you're landing clients, which help you do good work, which will help you get more clients. And so what's happening over time is, you know, not only is your work quality getting better because you're working with better clients and hopefully you're getting better budgets and you're getting better opportunities, which is going to help you compete and win and, you know, be more defensible, uh, be able to earn more per hour, hopefully at the end of the day, be able to make more in, in terms of profit. But then obviously that then starts to produce some network effects even at that level. So it's like even in that example, I feel like there's so much you can pull from it. Totally. It's the same basic thing that applies even with the world's largest companies like Apple, you know, like they sell more iPhones that gets more people using iMessage that gets more people like using the features of iMessage with their friends and family that gets you more likely to like not want to be a green bubble. (laughs) You know, they have more data so they can make things like touch ID work or like face ID work um, that require like a large amounts of user data in order to get right that makes Siri better. You know, there's all sorts of things feeding back. The most basic form of the feedback loop is like they get more money. So they can reinvest that money in the business to like have R&D that makes the like chips running the phone even better or like the camera quality even better. But those are the way that that loops work. And it's, it's cool because it kind of encapsulates network effects. It encapsulates economies of, of scale, which is like, okay, like Netflix has economies of scale because they have a huge amount of subscribers. So they get a huge amount of revenue so they can invest more of that revenue than their competitors can into creating more shows, which gives them, Mm -hmm. you know, even more of an advantage because you have more, more and better content than your competitors. So anyway, there's lots of different sort of like things, but I think a lot of it really does connect back to loops or flywheels or whatever you want to call them, recursive components of the system. I think that's the 80-20 is like, it's a holistic system. Everything you do is connected and interdependent and it's a recursive system. Maybe the other thing I would add is like, it's a system full of trade-offs. So a lot of the trade-offs we talked about before, like the really fancy fashion boutique versus like the like low cost kind of competitor, it's pretty easy to make the trade-offs in those examples because you're pretty clear on what your strategy is. But most businesses don't think clearly enough about trade-offs. 
Yeah. And, and they don't see trade-offs as an opportunity because the cool thing about trade-offs is they create defensibility because if you have a system and you're perfectly like dug in to like navigating the trade-offs in the way that works best for the thing that you're trying to create, the value, the unique value you're trying to create for your customers, then it becomes harder and harder for people to copy you without copying you wholesale. And that's never a good idea. <laughs> like for instance, it was relatively easy for Facebook to copy Snapchat because Snapchat had a very similar kind of network of like, I'm sharing this with like my close friends as Instagram did for most people. Mm -hmm. Some celebrities, it's like a little bit of a different thing, but most people it's like they're kind of communicating with their friends on Instagram. And so the stories format just plugs right in. There wasn't a lot of like trade-offs there for Facebook. They didn't have to copy Snapchat wholesale in order to get the value of that innovation. But for TikTok, the network structure is totally different. So I think Reels is going to have a much harder time succeeding because the purpose of the of the network in TikTok is really different than the purpose of the network in Instagram. In Instagram, I'm following people I know and some celebrities. In TikTok, I'm following random people that came across my for you page or whatever that I just thought were like funny or smart or pretty or whatever. And I like something about them. And it's almost like there's a really interesting quote from Charlie D'Amelio, the like biggest TikTok star. When she first started doing TikTok, she was kind of like, oh, like this is sort of a weird thing. Like if my friends saw that I was on TikTok, then like that would be embarrassing because people are like dancing and stuff. They're being weird, right? But it's like people love that because just people are weird. And so there's sort of like an anti- it's a network built around a totally different purpose and it's, it trades off with the thing that Instagram is good at, which is like sharing with friends mm -hmm. and family. So like maybe reels will work. I don't know. I'm not bullish on it right now um, based, based on what I've seen because of this sort of trade-off thing where like Instagram can't copy TikTok enough. Like they would have to create a wholesale clone. And so they can't just integrate that feature. It's not just a format basically. I love that idea. And I love that you're already kind of framing up how to think about strategy from an incumbent's point of view, from someone that's kind of new to the space and kind of both sides of that table. It seems like this is happening right now in a ton of different industries where there's kind of a small upstart that has to obviously have a very crisp idea of what their strategy is and how they're going to kind of be able to compete and win and grab market share and then be able to expand over over time competing against really large established players. You know, some examples that come to mind is like Open Door versus Zillow. Totally right. different model, totally different value proposition, or even something where maybe it's a little bit blurrier and I don't feel like I have a good grasp on the strategies each player is employing. So maybe an example of that would be something like DoorDash versus Grubhub, where, mm -hmm. you know, it's very clear that they're both playing very different games. They're obviously competing for the same market. How do you suggest, or maybe how do you think about how disruptive players that are coming into a market should be thinking about strategy? Is it really just all about almost like what's the spear tip? Like what's this kind of narrow window of opportunity or what is the thing that's very different that we feel like we can compete and win? So is it that spear tip approach or is it something else? And then, you know, if you're the large established incumbent, what is the successful strategy to employ there? And how do you not get tripped up focusing on competitors or, or should you be focusing on them more? These are really hard questions to answer in the abstract because it sort of depends on the specific like situation of the incumbent and like what specific threat they're facing. Or it depends on, you know, some startups, it's like they're actually focusing too narrow and there'd be a better opportunity if they thought about it more horizontally. And others are being way too scattered and they just really need to focus in on something more narrow. And it's all very situation dependent. Mm -hmm. So maybe the meta thing I would have as advice here, I think of it like a, like a function with inputs and outputs. And the inputs are like, observations about the market, like customer conversations you've had or like data you've seen or just observations about your own experience using things. Mm -hmm. And then the function itself, the operations inside the function that help you parse all this, all these inputs and make something useful out of it. These are the ideas from strategy. These are frameworks like, you know, Porter's Five Forces or like the idea of disruptive innovations or Seven Powers, Hamilton Helmer. He's, you know, got a lot of really interesting frameworks in that book. And then the output is like what your strategy is. You have your input of like specific observations about your environment, the function, which is the strategy frameworks, and then the output, which is what the strategy frameworks tell you to do, given your observations about the market. This is something I learned from Heaton Shaw in an interview I did with him. I think that a lot of people focus too much on the strategy frameworks and not enough on the quality of the inputs. Because with programming, hmm. there's this classic idea of like garbage in, garbage out. So if you have very like weak and scattered and non-systematic observations about the market sort of driving your decision making process, you can make some pretty, pretty bad decisions, even if you have all the strategy concepts, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's an important just sort of like meta observation is like paying more attention to your inputs. But then also, I think that there's a lot of startup founders who don't pay very much attention to like the strategy frameworks either. They have like a kind of a pretty simple view of like, okay, cool. I just like, you just need to solve a problem. I see a problem and then I'll solve it. And it's like, well, okay, like, that can work. That definitely can work. There's a lot of companies that have been created from just like that sort of like thing. But I think you have a greater chance of success if 
you understand sort of like, okay, how is this going to work as it scales? Like, what are the advantages mm-hmm. we really have? Like, what are the accumulating advantages we have? Which is another way of saying like, what's our loop? Which is another way of saying what's our flywheel? Like, these are the kind of things that are really important to pay attention to and to kind of be searching for. And it's kind of fine if you're like floundering for a little while, figuring it out and you have something in the market that's like basically working. But what you're searching for is really important. You need to be searching for, oh, cool, here's a loop that scales. And then you'll find one. And this is another really interesting idea from Kevin Kwok and also Eugene Wei is like, a company is not just like one loop that took them all the way. It's like, you find a string of loops. Like there's some initial thing that kind of works and then it sort of tapers off and then you have to like find another thing. And you have to have the idea of like, okay, here's a loop. Here's what I can expect it to do for us. Um, okay, we're focusing on this one now, but then it looks like it's slowing down. So we got to find another one that kind of like could scale even more. Maybe that's unlocked now because of the new position we're in. Those are the sort of mental models that I think enable someone to much more successfully build a build a large company than, you know, people are just like, oh, you just need to solve a problem. <laughs> yeah, no, those are super helpful concepts. Yeah, it's almost like rather than focusing on just being off the charts on kind of one axis, like not to say don't go off the charts on that axis, but also remember that there's a bunch of other axes that you need to be thinking about. And ultimately, if you're good and better than your competition or more unique than your competition or more differentiated than your competition across many of them, you're going to fucking have better odds of success there. Okay, so now I want to transition to talk a little bit about like one thing that I, I want to make sure to dig in with you is obviously you have a ton of experience on the operational side. You've got a pretty big data set just talking about all the things you've done so far in your career. Clearly, you love learning and you've learned a ton from nonfiction books. You've delved super deep into strategy. But you also, you know, one thing you've had to be really great at to get to where you are is just to be a really good writer. So I want to explore that generally. But one thing that I wanted to start with is, you know, in the role you're in now where you have some portion of, I'm guessing, your day and your week that you you need to spend in deep, uninterrupted work just to do all the research and writing and synthesis and editing and everything you need to do there. Yeah. How do you make time for that? How do you make sure that you set that up for success while at the same time being able to toggle to all the reactive, interruptive type of work that it takes to build a business? Because I just think that's a fascinating challenge. Yeah. Oh, man, I'm the worst at this. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> You're going to make me cry by asking this question. <laughs> <laughs> I have no I have no useful things to share here. I'm currently massively struggling with this. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but like, no, it is, <laughs> it's really, really, really hard. Yeah. I know how to have a week where I have got zero on my calendar and I just have to write something. And I know how to have a week where I've, I'm stacked with a bunch of meetings and I just need to like get through those and like get through my email and like do the sort of like shorter tasks that I need to do. Like, oh, I'm going to write up a partnership proposal for this person or whatever. Yeah. I don't know how to balance them. We're currently figuring out how to do that. The experiment that Dan and I started a couple weeks ago was to actually, at first we were thinking like, okay, like let's have like maker days or like maker mornings or something. And that just yeah. like wasn't enough because like to complete a post is like hard. It takes a lot of work and time. Yeah. How many hours does the average one take? I mean, it, it ranges... Hours is tough because there's like I'm sure you yeah. could you could be done in any one like in one day you're done and like more hours won't help but then like you have to let like a day pass or a night pass and you sleep on it and then you wake up in the morning and you're like oh yeah that was the thing and then you can write it yeah. or maybe that doesn't happen you kind of struggle along for like another day and it you know it's yeah, it's, it's sort of unpre- unpredictable and we try and make it as predictable as possible but I think there's just something about this kind of work that's like high risk basically of like, will you come up with the thing that's great? Is there even a great thing to be had here the way that you're currently approaching it? Like, you know, all that stuff's tough, but usually it takes about like anywhere from a couple days to a week to do the kinds of posts mm-hmm. that we're doing. And we've been told that the thing we're aiming for is the kind of thing that like, if you're publishing that kind of thing, like in the New Yorker, like that's the level we really want to get to. It's like, the, oh, they spend mm-hmm. months on that. Like, when, yeah. So, you know, and ours doesn't reach that level. We're also not spending that much time, but yeah, it's, um, we're trying to get there and we're trying to figure out how to make it work. And part of it is, I think just sort of like at some level, Dan and I have to like build a business and like have other great people that are doing that side of it more so than us right now where we're still, our writing contributes for a huge amount of the growth of the thing and and the retention of users. Um, We need to figure that out. And so we're trying my current best solution is, have you ever read the, like the, I don't know if this is like apocryphal or fictional or whatever, but there's like a, a funny, like Hunter S Thompson's writing schedule. No. What is that? <laughs> so it's like, okay, 3 p.m. he wakes up and he has some like Shavas in like Coke. And then he like he has this really huge meal and then like takes some acid and he like drinks a lot more, you know, like and he has like some champagne and like he's like smoking like several packs of cigarettes. And then at like midnight, he's ready to write and he writes until like, you know, 
4 a.m. or whatever, and he sleeps. So I don't, I don't actually, obviously, do that. But what I, what I do actually really do these days is I'll wake up around like nine or ten, and have like my meeting portion of my day, and then I'll mm-hmm. have like a nap, like around five, and eat some dinner, like and take a walk, and then around nine or ten, I'll start writing, and I'll keep doing that until about two. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. I kind of have like two days or whatever. This is part of the reason why uh, I have such a grizzled appearance right now. <laughs> <laughs> is uh i'm a little bit i'm a little bit in like insane mode i think some of some of these days and it's certainly not sustainable it's also quarantine mode is maybe another way of putting it like there's nothing else yeah to do it's definitely taking a toll on my tv watching <laughs> i'll put it that way I, I wish i could say that i was like you know oh like you know i get up and like i work out and then i've got like when i get up at 4 a.m and like you know the kind of like navy seal thing and like i'm just not that way at all and i, I don't think i ever will be Well, and I also find, too, that if we're all being honest, there's a lot more ebbing and flowing. Like there's times where things are clicking into place. There's times where, like you described, it feels like an absolute struggle. You know, one of the best books I've ever read on that, on the struggle to create something that is unique and hopefully iconic or like that's the kind of, I don't know, the pinnacle you're always going for. Um, There's a book I love called The War of Art, who's written Mm -hmm. by uh, written by Stephen Pressfield. And he's written a lot of other historical works that are incredible. But he has a whole book dedicated to what he thinks about is like what is that struggle uh that we're all going through and the resistance uh, yeah, yeah exactly the resistance that yeah, that we're all up against and, and how do we kind of surmount that you kind of alluded to it there but i feel like one one thing i'd love to just go in a little bit further on i guess get your thoughts on is i've never met anyone that's able to do really remarkable work again and again and again where it's always like oh yeah i can do that in four hours and i just follow these steps and i always get there every single time yeah. anyone i know that's always done something really remarkable and is able to do that knows that the process is very unpredictable it's not something that can be time boxed you can't even i think even really approach it from like an efficiency standpoint and i guess in my mind the way i've always thought about it is it's a lot more like alcohol me where you're trying to combine these elements and just try to get the right amount of these different things. What do you do to make sure you always have interesting ideas that are kind of bubbling up or fresh takes on things? So how are you taking in information? How are you kind of synthesizing the stuff that you're reading and researching? And and then how does that make its way into the writing that you do? I think my most generalizable advice that's also maybe the most interesting and surprising is to be more indulgent than you think you should be. I think people have a mindset of being really like diligent where they're like, Mm -hmm. Oh, I like need to do this. So I should do it. Like I was assigned to do this. It doesn't matter if I'm like not feeling it. I need to do it. And you definitely need a lot of that. You need a lot of discipline and, and sort of like, there's going to be moments when you feel like quitting and like you shouldn't quit. But at the same time you need to balance it with, okay, this is a little different than like what we were originally thinking, but like this could be really great. And to like sort of allow yourself to go there and maybe just give yourself permission to try it. Be like, I'm, yeah, I'm just going to spend like an hour on this. And like, we'll see. Maybe it's nothing, whatever. That is where all the good stuff comes from, in my opinion. And people shut it off because they're like, ah, no, that's not on task, you know? Yeah. And so the big difference is if it feels like you're being indulgent in a sort of distracted way where you're not actually even working on anything in this zone at all, or you're just fiddling around with stuff like, oh, I'm just setting up my tools or whatever, then like, that's not good. But if you're exploring in a direction that's genuine progress, but maybe there's some expectations in your head Mm -hmm. from like a client or a friend or a colleague or an editor or whatever. For yourself. Yeah, for yourself is the most important one. But it's like often (laughs) I think we, the the version of ourself that like is going to come up with a great thing, like there, it already it's already there inside our heads. It's these voices that we've internalized that are telling us to like do something else. Like a lot of it's like, honestly, our teachers back to my school thing. (laughs) But like, you know, that is, I think, really important. And I think most great stuff ends up being kind of unexpected. But it's like when you're in the thick of it, when you're in the details of it, you could see a thing that was you couldn't see from the outside. Sometimes Mm -hmm. when you're in the thick of it, you see why the thing you thought originally wouldn't work and you don't know something better. Other times when you're in the thick of it, you see a new thing that's like, the old thing could be kind of good too, but this new thing may be even better, you know? And I think just being able to follow those things and knowing the difference between doing that and like just basically procrastinating is a really, really important and useful skill. And I think it's applicable pretty broadly across writing or developing software or whatever. The reason why it's rare is because school beats it out of us. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, I think changing the task when you're in the middle of it is the secret. <laughs> it's it's yeah, not the yeah. secret, but whatever. It's like one trick that like has worked well for me because I'm naturally very ADD and indulgent. So. <laughs> I have unusual advantages in this regard. So that works well for you anyways, just personally. (laughs) 
So I wanted to ask, um, I have a couple closing questions I'll get to in a second, but I just wanted to quickly ask two questions that came in from people on Twitter. One's from Kinjal Shah, who asked an amazing question, so well written. What mental models and frameworks do you refer to most when you're writing about a company or an industry? Mm, that's I know a great we've covered one. this a little bit, but... The one that I haven't talked about is I call the framework finding power and it's based on an idea called the law of conservation of modularity by Clay Christensen. It's how to say, okay, what is the value chain that this company exists in? Like what are the activities that precede it that like form the sort of inputs that the company uses? Then what are the activities that the company itself does? And then what are the downstream uses of their thing? Like how does it end up getting the stuff they create getting used in the world? It's actually a really good framework for understanding where the power is going to sit in any value chain. Because most value chains, there's like a critical choke point where there's some really powerful, profitable company that's like in a super defensible position. And there's a post I wrote about it. The short version of it is at any given moment, the thing that's most broken, that people most want improved, that's like the the most important thing for this thing to get better at, the company that controls the layers of the value chain, the activities that determine the performance of that thing, power tends to accumulate there. And when Mm -hmm. something else becomes more important, power tends to accumulate at some other place. You know, there's ideas like, oh, here's our core competency. We should just stick to it. And it's like, well, just because it's core to you doesn't mean it's like most important to customers. <laughs> and that can yeah. and that stuff can shift over time. And so um, there's a lot of really interesting examples of like how that happens and why it's true and whatever. But that's that's one that I keep coming back to and I find to be the most useful and underrated framework. And, and there's also like lots of ex- explanation in the post, like justification, like why that's true and examples and all this kind of stuff. We'll definitely link to that in the show notes. Okay, one other question. This one's from Eric Berg. Biggest piece of advice for young people aspiring to be strategic leaders? And I'm guessing there that just the idea is like, it's somebody who probably is in business, so they might be a founder or a CEO, someone who wants to, who like, maybe especially after hearing this, they're like, okay, I want to learn more about strategy. I feel like it's important. What are the things that you would recommend they go to first? You might be the books that they read or the, the writers that they look up. It's really hard to give general advice. So I'll just give the advice that worked for me, which is to create your own stuff because uh, it's a way to jump the line. It's really hard when you've not created a lot of stuff of your own that's become successful independently for people to like look at you and want to take a bet on you. But if you've done that before, then people are like, oh, this person can make things that turn out to be really mm-hmm. good. So like I yeah. trust them. That's an easy way to, dem- I mean, it's not easy. It's really hard, but that's like a permissionless way to demonstrate that you're worthy of responsibility. Sure. Just by, you know, having put some skin in the game previously and I guess had some successes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So to wrap up, we've covered a lot of stuff, a lot of high level concepts. You referenced a ton of books and and authors and people's ideas. All that will be in the show notes, but maybe just to put a tip on it, you know, for someone that's listening to this, that's super interested in learning more about strategy, obviously they can subscribe to divinations and they should that's all uh, I need. but where no other recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it that's it well and just to be a subscriber to the everything bundle uh, that's, yeah. that's growing and getting better but what are the starting points like if someone is starting from a literal basis of you know they think the subject's interesting but they really just don't know anything where would you suggest that they start there's a few posts that are probably the easiest starting points because they're like recent and they're, they're blog posts. So they're not like full books, but then you should go from there to like books and like even like case studies that they teach in business school and stuff like that. Sure. One post that's great to start with is Invisible Asymptotes by Eugene Wei. There's a post, I forget exactly what it's titled, but it's about Figma by Kevin Kwok. And it talks Got about it. their like way they've okay. strung together different, different loops kind of to grow. You know, Ben Thompson aggregation theory, I think can get a little confusing Maybe it's slightly overrated in some ways. I don't know. Like it's a very interesting one, but I don't think it's like up there with like loops or invisible asymptotes, but it's something that certainly a lot of people reference. And then I would go just like dig way into like Clay Christensen and Michael Porter and Hamilton Helmer, most of their work. And that's like basically what I'm, what I'm doing with divinations is exploring all of those thinkers. I think that's sort of like a really great foundation and starting point. That's amazing. Thank you so much. We've covered a ton of super interesting stuff about a topic that I feel like is, you know, you alluded to and we talked about is not well understood, is really hard for a lot of people to grasp onto. Where can people subscribe? Where can people find you online? So divinations.substack.com is where I write everything. And then also, if you just want to like keep up with me and hang out on the world's chat room, that is Twitter. Twitter is great. So I'm Nathan Bashez. Uh, my handle is N-B-A-S-H-A-W on Twitter. So obviously people can go and and look up your writing. Where can people go to find out more about everything? And can you maybe just share a little bit about all that people will get if they subscribe to everything? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the company I've alluded to that I'm building with Dan is this bundle of newsletters. So Divinations is one of them. That's the strategy focused one that I write. But also we've got a talk show with Lee Jin, formerly of Andreessen Horowitz, who who'd kind of coined the term passion economy called Means of Creation. Dan writes a really awesome one called Super Organizers. That's about productivity. I don't know if you've heard of Tiago Forte, but he's amazing, has a course called Building a Second Brain. So his blog, Praxis, which is a paid newsletter, is also bundled in with us. We've got another one called Napkin Math that's on investing and strategy. Anyway, there's a lot of great stuff. More is getting out all the time. We've got a bunch of really amazing stuff in our pipeline and uh, you can get it all for $20 a month or $200 a year. If you want to subscribe to Divinations, you subscribe to everything and you get access to like whatever you want. You can choose your email settings for each newsletter individually. But yeah, that's the company we're building. We hope it becomes a really awesome institution almost of like helping practitioners with stuff that's useful for their jobs, but is also sort of beautifully written. And helping us have one subscription instead of 10, which always always sounds good. (laughs) Thank you so much for the time. It was amazing to catch up and amazing to have you on. So thank you so much, Nathan.